asking questions in the data until you discover the root cause. Share your analysis securely. Your entire organization can access these interactive dashboards from any browser or mobile device to find their own answers. Tableau, answer questions at the speed of thought. Hey everyone, I'm Jun Han Zhao, a PhD candidate at Purdue University computer graphics major and a research internship at Bosch Research North America. Here, we are presenting our recent research across the viewer using factorized prototypes to visually interpret and diagnose deep neural network. This work is co-authored by research scientists at Bosch, Zeng Dai, Dr. Pan Pan Xu, and Dr. Liu Ren. Tableau helps you see the stories in your data. It's designed to help you be smarter so you can make better decisions faster. With Tableau, you can keep on asking questions in the data until you discover the root cause. Share your analysis securely. Your entire organization can access these interactive dashboards from any browser or mobile device to find their own answers. Tableau, answer questions at the speed of thought. We present our work on data visualization, a technique which helps facilitate understanding of physical measurements and quantities by providing visible experiences to users in virtual reality. This allows them to experience the ground truth of what the data is in reality as compared to the abstract nature of conventional data visualization. 
We hope our work will spur new considerations into how immersive technologies can be used for visualizing information and that you will find it interesting. What do you believe is the correlation between labor union participation and corporate profits of different companies? How would you update your belief after seeing this scatter plot? In this study, we use a new elicitation technique to understand how people update their beliefs about correlations after seeing different visualizations with and without uncertainty depictions. Tableau helps you see the stories in your data. It's designed to help you be smarter, so you can make better decisions faster. With Tableau, you can keep on asking questions in the data until you discover the root cause. Share your analysis securely. Your entire organization can access these interactive dashboards from any browser or mobile device to find their own answers. Tableau, answer questions at the speed of thought. Given a dimensionality reduction scatterplot, we project its original subspace. Through the orientation and shape of our glyphs, both the global trends and the local patterns can be identified. Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to our session of the event sequence. And I'm Siming Chen from Fudan University. And uh, I would like to briefly introduce myself. And I was from Peking University. And then I was working with Gennady and Natalia in Fraunhofer, in Germany for three years. And just two months ago, I moved to Shanghai as a start my new faculty position. So I'd like to warmly welcome all the speakers today. Let's move to the first uh, speaker uh, by Jiang Wu, and his talk is Visionetics of Multivariate Invent Sequence Data in Racket Response. Welcome. Hello, everyone. I'm Jiang from Zhejiang University. Today, I'm pleasure to introduce our paper, Viral Analytics of Multivariate Event Sequence Data in Racket Response. Racket sports like badminton, tennis, and table tennis are popular all over the world because they are highly competitive. In racket sports, players need to use a racket to hit the ball. In each rally, the two players need to hit the ball alternatively from one player serving to one player swinging. Thus, we naturally consider each hit as an event consider each rally as an event sequence. However, there may exist hundreds of original sequences in one match, which can hardly be analyzed. Domain experts usually want to obtain high-level insights about the players' strategies. There are some frequently used subsequences shared by many original sequences. We extract them to construct the tactical patterns, which can easily reveal the player's strategies. Thus, a sequential pattern mining algorithm is needed to extract the pa tactical patterns. Existing work proposes many pattern mining algorithms and realizations for event sequence data. However, 
These algorithms and visualizations cannot be directly applied to our data because of multiple attributes. When player hit the ball, many things needed to be considered, such as the player's position, the technique used to hit, and so on. Thus, each hit in racket sport is multivariant. The multivariant data brings two challenges. First, it is challenging to design a multivariant pattern mining algorithm. For example, there are two sequences needed to extract the pattern. Each sequence includes five hits, and we consider two attributes, namely the technique used to hit and the position of the ball. When domain experts want to focus on the technique, we can quickly find the consecutive hits of A, thus the technical pattern is the first three hits. However, when domain experts want to focus on ball position, the pattern changes to the consecutive hits of B. In actual, the real-world data set can be more complicated. A pattern mining algorithm that can comprehensively consider multiple attributes is needed. Second, the multiple attributes make each hit complicated. Each hit may have about 5 attributes, and each attribute may have about 10 optional values. There may be more than 7,000 distinct events. One more step, players can use consecutive hits to achieve different strategies, such as consistent ground days and forcing the opponent to run side to side. Actually, players in racket sports prefer changeable strategies so that they can win against different players. Thus, domain experts usually want to know how the athletes adapt their strategies to different scenarios so that they can know the athletes comprehensively. However, when comparing two multivariant patterns, the patterns can differ in many ways. Multiple attributes to be compared make it hard to find the differences between two patterns. To address the first challenge, we propose an MDL-based multivariant pattern mining algorithm. To address the second challenge, we propose a viral analytics system. Our algorithm improves an existing MDL-based algorithm MinDL. To represent the original sequences, this algorithm extracts the common sequ subsequences as patterns and names the left events as corrections. So the sequences are mapped to patterns and corrections based on the patterns. Then, MinDL counts the events in the patterns and the number of corrections, and defines the mapping cost based on the two counts. MinDL targets to find the mapping with the lowest mapping cost, which means the patterns are well summarized. We improve this algorithm with the ability to calculate the multivariant mapping cost. The core idea of our algorithm is that when mapping a multivariant sequence to a multivariant pattern, we traverse each attribute and calculate the mapping cost for each attribute. Finally, we added the mapping cost for each attribute with weight to obtain the multivariant mapping cost. The detailed definition of our mapping cost can be found in our paper. Due to time constraints, we are very sorry that I cannot introduce here. To address the second challenge of multivariant comparison, we propose an interactive viral analytics system for comparative analysis in racket sports. To develop this system, we collected and summarized five requirements from our domain experts. Based on these requirements, we proposed our real design, which includes five views. First, domain experts can input their domain knowledge in attribute editor so that our algorithm can consider multiple attributes comprehensively and merge some similar patterns automatically. In attribute editor, Users can drag the slider to adjust the weight of different attributes. 
We also use the bar chart to visualize the distribution of all values, which can guide users to adjust the weights. We also allow users to group similar values in Attribute Editor, so that our algorithm can automatically merge the patterns with similar values. Second, we design Glyph Editor to display multiple attributes simultaneously. We use different encodings to encode different attributes of a heat, and combine them together to construct the glyph for the heat. In the glyph editor, we propose a steerable glyph design. Users can select the encoding methods for each attribute, select the encodings for each value, and adjust the position of each symbol. Moreover, our system provides lots of predefined templates to simplify users' operations. Third, we design a scatter plot and a pattern comparator to provide multiple level comparison, so that domain experts can quickly find the differences between patterns in two scenarios. For comparing patterns in different scenarios, we design a pattern comparator for one-to-one -one comparison. Users can construct two scenarios to be compared. After running the algorithm, all tactical patterns will be shown. The bar charts at the center support quick comparison of frequency and winning rate of patterns. We project patterns in the scatter plot for high-level comparison. Each point represents a pattern. The distance between two patterns encodes the similarity. For each point, we use a pie chart to encode the frequency of the pattern in two scenarios. We also visualize the winning rate with the other side arc. Finally, we designed instance view to show detailed sequences within a pattern. We visualized the original sequences, the outcomes, and the values of each attribute. We evaluated our system by conducting two usage scenarios together with four professional domain experts. Here is one of our usage scenarios. This usage scenario explores how Djokovic chooses tactical patterns. There are four attributes in our data to be analyzed, namely, strike tech, ball position, strike position, and spin kind. The analyst adjusted the importance of strike tech to 7 and the one of strike position to 2 to focus more on strike tech. The analyst also cancelled the selection of spin kind to ignore the weak influence of this attribute. Then, the analyst checked the glyph design recommended by our system. He viewed all the optional encoding methods, explored the symbols for each value, and tried to change the symbols for each value. Finally, the shape encodes strike tech. The matrix encodes ball position, and the donut encodes strike pose. After that, he began to conduct comparative analysis. The analyst set up some filters to construct two subsets. One was the set of rallies served by Djokovic and before deuces, the other was the set of rallies served by Djokovic and after deuces. After running the algorithm, the tactical patterns were updated. The analyst viewed the scatter plot first. He found that the orange arcs were usually long, which meant that Djokovic had great performance after deuces. He turned to pattern comparator and found that the top three patterns after deuces had similarly high frequency and high winning rate. He hovered on each pattern and viewed the position of the pattern in the scatter plot. He found that two of the patterns were far away from others, which meant that these two patterns were unusual. The analyst observed these two patterns and found that Djokovic hit the ball left and right to force his opponent to run side to side. After that, his opponent would use a defensive technique by backhand at the left backcourt. Finally, the analyst further clicked on the pattern to view the original sequences and multiple attributes. After the usage scenarios, the main experts gave us their feedback. They praised our work on the steerable adjustment of multi-attribute weights, the multi-level comparison between two scenarios, and the tailored kit design. They also suggested us to link each sequence 
to the raw video and detect abnormal patterns automatically. Make a conclusion, our contributions include a very analytics framework for racket sports data, a steerable multivariant pattern mining algorithm, and an interactive viral analytics system for comparative analysis. In the future, we plan to extend our framework to a wider range of sports, such as soccer and basketball. We also plan to apply causal analysis to find the hits resulting in a winning sequence. Thank you for your listening, and we thank the funding agencies for their generous support. Okay, thank you very much for the very interesting talk. And now we come to the questions. So I saw people are typing in Discord, so I asked first question. And, uh, and, and Yang, and I think the glyph is really interesting, but it's a little bit complicated in the system. So have you find that is it expert, easy to use to, or to learn the, to configure the glyphs? Uh, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, our system does uh, dedicate part of our uh, design choices or some uh, adjustment on the data to users. Uh, that's users with the prior knowledge of the our system can uh, use it easily. Uh, however, even without prior knowledge of our system, domain experts can learn the uh, learn to use our system in a short time because we simplify the uh, our system. Uh, from some aspects. Uh, first, we provide some uh, an extensive set of templates of glyph designs or some templates of uh, settings of the data on the system so that uh, the, um, the templates can help users save time and effort uh, for using our system. Um, domain experts really need to um, modify some configurations for uh, in our system when analyzing, um, uh, and they can focus on the uh, analyzation. Uh, analyze. Uh, second, we provide some uh, real encodings to cover the attributes in our data site, uh, so domain experts can easily use our system. Okay, thank you. And there are so many questions from the Discord, and I have to only pick one maybe. So the one first one is the what is the average sequence length, and how do you deal with a long sequence? Do you extract multiple patterns for long sequences? So just please use some short answers uh, about the average sequence length. How is it? Oh, okay. Uh, we choose a. Uh, uh, is the question about the uh, MDL based algorithm? Uh, yeah, you can just answer it shortly. Okay, we choose the MDL based algorithm um, based on two considerations. Uh, firstly, it's a highly tolerant of uh, noisy data, in, in which is uh, commonly in racket sports. Uh, second, it can summarize the whole data site. Uh, as we all know, in racket sports, the players use uh, some killer patterns, uh, means which are important, but on Euro. Uh, some SPM-based uh, algorithm connect detect them, um, but MDR algorithm can. Okay, so um, because of the time, and thank you again, Jiang. Oh, thank and you. And please go to the Discord to answer them. There are many questions there waiting for you. The last two seconds. Uh, Gennady Andrianko, and uh, his talk will be which, uh, constructing spaces and times for tactical analysis in football. Let's welcome Gennady.
This work is a result of close collaboration between a group of visual analytics researchers, data scientists, football professionals working for Deutsche Bundesliga and German Football Association, and a small company in the Netherlands. Football is a simple game. 22 men chase the ball for 90 minutes, and at the end the Germans always win. To guarantee that the Germans shall win in the future, we analyze football data. Typically, football data consists of sequences of 2D timestamped positions of the players, 2D or three-dimensional positions of the ball, and records of various event game events, such as passes, shots, tackles, and so on. These events are extracted manually and often contain errors in positions, times, and attributes. Let me briefly introduce uh, the idea of football tactics. In football, uh, there are two teams consisting of uh, goalkeeper and 10 infield players, and during the game the ball possession is changed uh, between the two teams. An important aspect of uh, tactics in football is special arrangement of the players within the teams. This is called team formations. This is how team formations appear in uh, game records and, for example, in mass media. It is very important to understand that uh, team formations vary depending on game situations. For example, they vary in different phases of the game, and let's consider possession change, what may happen to, uh, to the formations. The team that uh, wins the ball uh, may have different strategies. They may try to counter attack or alternatively safeguard and build up for future development of the attack. The team that uh, lost the ball may lead to fall back and defend or alternatively perform counter pressing. Our research goal is to uh, develop approaches uh, to detect and interpret general patterns of team behavior in, uh, and understand how they vary and develop in relationship to event and more generally context in different classes of game situations. Respectively, this requires first methods for selecting groups of game situations with particular characteristics, second, uh, deriving general patterns of team behavior from uh, these game situations, and third, enable comparison of general patterns for different groups of situations. Our approach consists of three main uh, components, first, sophisticated incremental time query, second, aggregation and construction of spaces and times, and this enables us to uh, perform efficient pattern visualization. All game data refer to time moments or time frames. Each time frame is characterized by uh, attributes of players and the ball, specifically uh, their positions and other mo attributes of their movement, and also game events uh, of uh, uh, various types. Respectively, uh, time query needs to uh, have tools for selecting uh, time frames according to their attributes. Moreover, we would like to unite the selected time moments into time intervals or episodes. In this operation, we first need to be precise, so we allow only intervals that satisfy given conditions, for example, given duration. And second, we have to be tolerant. We, for example, we ignore breaking episodes by a few unselected uh, time moments. And when appropriate, we shift or extend or restrict the selected intervals in time. This allows us to address the imperf imperfection of the data and uh, the specifics of the uh, uh, game. Let us consider an example of incremental uh, time query construction. As the game recording uh, has a duration of about 2 hours or about 200,000 uh, frames, uh, we first start with excluding uh, episodes when the game uh, was stopped. This results in 102 episodes consisting of about 100,000 uh, frames. Next, we focus only on frames with a ball possession by one of the teams. This results in 230 episodes uh, consisting of about 40,000 frames. 
Next, we exclude episodes which are very short, short even one second. And on the next step, focus only on the frames when the ball is in the attacking third of the uh, ball possessing team. And finally, we extend the selected intervals by adding uh, one second before each of the selected episodes. This produces uh, finally 60 episodes consisting of about 8000 frames. It is obvious to use spaces for visualizing spatial data. One possible space for visualization is the pitch space. However, formations are supposed to be kept in different uh, locations on the pitch. Therefore, we introduce a so-called team space where we position all players in respect to the center of the team, excluding the goalkeeper. This is an example of a single episode on the pitch on the left and in the team space uh, on the right. Lines represent trajectories of uh, the players and the ball during uh, the episode. Uh, dots in the middle of each line, for example here, represent average positions during the episode. Note that highly coordinated movement of team players on the pitch correspond to mostly stationary points in the team space. Representation in the team space allows us to create glyphs that uh, represent activities of the players uh, in the team. For example, in this uh, glyph, Jerome Boateng spends most of his time on the back right of, of the team, a bit less in the center back of the team, and a little bit in the center of the team. The glyph can be extended by a temporal component that allows to see uh, how much time a player spent on the pitch. So we can observe that one player was substituted by another. And these glyphs may be located on the pitch or in the team space, showing uh, the relative positions of the players in the team. Each query results in an aggregate that summarizes the selected situations, for example, by averaging positions of players. We can consider a sequence of queries as a new time domain. For example, T1 corresponds to ball possession by, uh, by the red team and T2 by the ball possession by the yellow team. Connecting the dots helps to see changes between the aggregates of a situation, like uh, here. Obviously, this idea can be extended to sequences longer than two time steps, following score changes, substitutions, relative times within episodes, and so on. The idea of sequencing situations facilitates comparison and study of the dynamics in longer sequences. Moreover, it can be combined with a space construction approach, enabling comparison not only in the pitch coordinates, but also in the team space. When aggregating situations, it is necessary to take into account that averages, as well as any other aggregates, are not sufficient to understand the studied process. Adding indicators of variation, such as convex hulls uh, covering 50% of values, as shown here on the map and in the space-time cube for selected tra trajectories, make visuals more, much more informative. In the paper, we consider three use cases of unhiding the team's tactics using the proposed approaches. First use case uh, concerns the behavior of uh, teams in transition periods when losing re and recovering the ball, uh, considering a single game and comparison of multiple games. Further use cases include movement of uh, players during long passes and team movement while preparing shots. We observe highly coordinated movement of players during long passes. Interestingly, while pass destinations are distributed along the pitch, they concentrate in a rather small area in the team space. For understanding team behavior in transition periods, we created a series of queries aggregating positions on the pitch and in the team space every second after the possession change, separately for losing the ball, shown in black, and regaining the ball, shown in yellow. The results clearly represent the team tactics, compactness in the defense, and wide attacks. 
Following the same approach, we performed a study for comparing the tactics of the same team in two different games. We can observe some similarity, however, we also encounter important differences required by different skills of uh, the team's opponents. In the last use case, we aggregated positions of the players and the ball shortly before the shot, one second earlier, two seconds earlier, and so on. These trajectories are shown on the pitch on the left. Similarly, we aggregated positions of the team centers and the ball uh, over time. This allowed us to reconstruct frequent paths of successful attacks. In the paper, we propose a seamless integ integration of powerful time query, aggregation and visualization, facilitating comparison and understanding of dynamics. The highlight of our approach is a way how we construct times and spaces for analysis. We uh, applied these ideas to complex and interesting use cases in football and received very positive evaluation by professionals. These methods have a variety of potential applications for different stakeholders cl – clubs, leagues, scouts, mass media and uh, so on. And if you are interested to learn more, we have further considerations and ideas uh, on these uh, topics in our recently published books – book on visual analytics for data scientists. Many thanks for your attention. We will be glad to answer your questions either online or offline. Okay, thank you very much for an interesting talk. And there are so many questions, so probably we can only have one. And Maybe the, two. Okay. <laughs> the, so Thomas Davison asks, what is the shortest feasible time for obtaining the data required for a system? Do you think in the future it might be possible to integrate it as a real-time system, for example, to aid coaching or analysis in the match? Actually, the data are collected now by all major leagues uh, and clubs, and there are many uh, tools that allow almost instant uh, transformation of video into uh, data stream. So this is uh, not a problem. But if you want to uh, look at the tactical patterns, you need to look at data over some time period. So it's not sufficient uh, to look uh, in the first five minutes of a game, but probably you need to observe at least 10 or 15 minutes to understand how uh, the team is playing. But generally, yes, in, in, this is possible. Okay, before we will have a second quick question. 
and kind of analyze and to lead to the prediction of moves to help the camera to get the best shot at the early action. This is a very interesting idea. Honestly, we think about that. So, <laughs> thank you for the question. We should I'd work on. We should uh, really work in the, uh, try to work in that direction. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Kennedy. And uh, there are so many questions in the Discord. Would you please just move there to answer them in the text? Okay. Okay. Thank you. So, thank you again. And so we come to the third one. So, from uh, Xie Xiao. And his talk is Pass Baser Toward Better Understanding of the Dynamics of Soccer Passes. So we come to the second soccer game. So please go ahead. Hi, everyone. I'm Xiao from Zhejiang University. I'm going to introduce our work Pass Visa Toward Better Understanding of the Dynamics of Soccer Passes. Passing is an important action in soccer. It can be used to create shooting chances for offense and can also control ball possession for defense. Passing is highly dynamic in a soccer match. Players may face different situations and this forces them to use different types of passing to address problems. And we call this as dynamics of passing. Analyzing these dynamics is crucial for improving team performance. There are many two types of passing analysis. The first one is network-based approaches. For example, researchers construct passing networks and use network indicators to analyze the passing styles. They have also used sliding windows to create temporal networks for passing analysis. However, all these works require an application process that breaks a series of passes into multiple independent passes. Sequence-based approaches are therefore introduced. For example, researchers transform passing to sequences of spatial regions and apply sequential pattern mining to detect spatial patterns. Similarly, some researchers detect sequential patterns of player roles in passing. Although useful, these works did not analyze the passing dynamics as the temporal information of passing is not included. For the visualizations, there were a variety of useful works analyzing soccer data. However, these works have different focuses and few analyze the passing and its dynamics in details. Therefore, a visualization system for analyzing passing dynamics remains absent. In this study, we designed PassVisa to fully analyze the passing dynamics. Users can hover on a pattern diagram to see all the passing patterns. It is the characteristics and how these patterns distributed over phases. They can further click on a pattern to see its phases, select one phase to see the passing, and inspect the player statistics during passing. We face three challenges when developing this system. The first one is the passing pattern detection. We desire to preserve the player identity information in passing patterns for more clear analysis. However, this is quite challenging according to our test. We applied sequential pattern mining to a matrix passing sequences and found that most of the patterns only contain two players, which is not informative for analysis. The second challenge is the problem characterization of dynamic passing analysis. Although the passing analysis is popular, only few of them focus on analyzing the passing dynamics, thereby lacking a thorough comprehension of the problem domain. The third challenge is about visualizing the passing of multiple phases. Existing visualizations focus on visualizing passes in a soccer phase. However, how to visualize the dynamic process of hundreds of phases remains to be resolved. Overall, we propose a topic-based passing pattern mining characterize domain requirements, and develop a visualization system to address the three challenges. And next, I will introduce the three parts one by one. First, I will introduce our passing data. For each pass, we record the parser, the receiver, and their related spatial positions. Then, consecutive passes of a team are regarded as a phase. We also label the end event of a phase, like tackle or shooting. 
With the data, we aim to detect a set of passing patterns. The core idea is to use the concurrence of players to characterize passing. For example, a player may have different options for the passing. We consider that this passing option is affected by the team's passing strategy. When the team is applying a long passing strategy, the player may pass the ball to one that far away from him. Hence, the strategy may cause a tendency of passing, which further causes the concurrence of players in passing. This inspires us to use the observed concurrence patterns to characterize the high-level passing strategies. The previous thinking reminds us that passing is similar to text to some extent. For example, the strategy is similar to the topic of documents, the tendency is similar to the word distribution, and the prayer concurrence is similar to the word concurrence. Based on this idea, we apply topic modeling to detect passing patterns. For the detection process, we first categorize all the phases into build up and counter attack, as these two kinds of phases have very different passing. We then apply topic modeling to each set of phases respectively and identify a set of passing patterns for further analysis. For the problem categorization, we invite four experts and conduct semi structured interviews. We then derive three level requirements for, for passing dynamics. For the match level, users need to know how many passing patterns does the team involve and what are the characteristics. For the phase level, users need to know how the passing involves, how it co-evolves with the defense, and the benefits of passing. Finally, for the individual level, users need to know the details of passing and the performance of players. We design our system based on the requirements. We provide a pattern diagram for learning passing patterns and their characteristics, a pattern flow for understanding the dynamics of passing patterns, and a phase wheel for expanding the passing process and player statistics. In the pattern diagram, we use a list of soccer pitches to encode the passing patterns. The upper encodes the pattern of build up, and the bottom encodes the pattern of counter attack. We use numbers to encode players and a bar chart to show the overall passing of each player. Users can have on a pattern and the corresponding players will be highlighted. The inner bar shows the passing frequency of this pattern. On top of each pattern, we use a bar to show its frequency in a match. We also use a heat map to show the positions of players in this pattern. We then use a pattern flow to show the dynamics of passing patterns. Each rectangle encodes a phase, and the thumb is from left to right. We place a node in each rectangle, and the vertical position encodes the pattern of each phase. Clicking a pattern can show the phases that use this pattern. Each rectangle shows the passing information of a phase, and we use a set of glyphs to summarize a phase. For each phase, the first parser and the last receiver are the most important information, and we encode this information with player grids. We then want to see the spatial position of players and use a spatial grid to show this information. For the encoding, we divide the pitch into nine regions and use the visual features to encode the region. We also want to know the formation and use a formation grid to encode this information. Each line shows a formation line, and the highlighted line shows the position in the formation. With this encoding, we can summarize a phase passing. For the variation, we invite four domain experts for conducting case studies. The data we use is U15 matches. Now let's see a case. In the beginning, the experts try to obtain an overview of the passing. In the pattern diagram, they noticed six passing patterns. They decided to learn the passing pattern of build-up first. They ranked the passing patterns based on the frequency and discovered three passing patterns with high-density areas on heat maps. The experts then hover on each passing pattern to learn the characteristics. Based on the linked players and the bar beside players, the experts knew that the three passing patterns represent a tactic for attacking midfielders. 
a tactic for the forward 9 and a tactic for the other forward 11. Based on the heat map, the S was learned that the passing pattern of attacking midfielders frequently occur in the left flank, and the patterns of the two forwards can be frequently seen in the right side of the pitch. Overall, either of the three patterns represented that a set of players continue on attacking the same area. The experts were interested with the usage of these passing patterns and switched to the pattern flow for further explorations. The experts found that the three patterns frequently occur in the first half. According to this information, the experts deduced that Argentina switched between the three passing patterns to conduct attacks in the first half. Specifically, the first was active at the right and may attract the attention of the opponents. This could give attacking midfielders sufficient space for attacks in the left side. However, there was a significant decrease of the pattern of forward nine in the second half. To investigate this decrease, the experts clicked on the pattern to inspect the passing in detail. The experts found that the end of passing was consistent as in most phases the last receiver was forward 9. According to the event, the experts found that this kind of passing was inefficient for the attack as most of the passes were tackled by the opponents and none of them create a shooting chance. The experts comment that Argentina may realize that this kind of passing was not effective against the defense of Brazil in the halftime interval and decided to deduce this inefficient passing in the second half. Such a change of passing contributed to the win of Argentina. The experts comment that the system provides useful summarization of a set of passing records, intuitive visual representation of passing in the face, and smooth interactions of coordinated views. They also suggest that the system can provide flexible selection of color themes and powerful filtering of soccer faces. For the conclusion, we contribute a hierarchical problem characterization of passing dynamics, a topic-based passing pattern mining approach, and an interactive visual analytics system. In the future, we plan to consider the influence of opponents in the passing detection and apply the method to a series of soccer matches. We thank the funding agency for their generous support. Thank you for your listening. I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you very much for the interesting talk. And uh, we come to the second uh, football games. So I think uh, I have a first question is that as you, you uh, it's your open, oh, okay. Yeah, and uh, the first question is uh, because you use the topic modeling. So do you think, do you use some additional time information for that or ignore the time information in the topic? Yeah. So we just uh we use a topic order just like a uh, natural language and we uh ignore the time here so we just regard it as a sequence. Okay, and uh, for the for the expert evaluation, do they provide some further suggestions for the usage for for that in your future? Yeah. So now the system want to allow users to analyze. Uh, a single match and they would like to apply it to maybe a, a season's match and to analyze some consistent pattern across a season. Yeah, so that would be much useful. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. And uh, now we see the Discord and not yet to the question. And uh, now I thank you again. And uh, let's go to the fourth one. Once upon a time in visualization, 
understanding the use of textual narratives for causality presented by Arjun Kohri. Hello, my name is Arjun Chaudhary and welcome to my talk on a joint work titled Once Upon a Time in Visualization, Understanding the Use of Textual Narratives for Causality. As the name suggests, this work explores narratives as a medium of expressing the causality in networks and presents an effective method of linearizing them. In general, causality pertains to addressing how a change in one entity causes variations in other entities. Each causal relation has a starting stimuli, also known as a cause, and leads to a change in the state of the network, thus causing an effect. To align with the terminology used in the network, I would like to accustom you with a few terms. Starting with interventions, they are the external stimulus provided to certain nodes in the system. Example, increasing X1 by 20%. On the other hand, objective nodes are the nodes that the user is interested in seeing the impact of the interventions on. Hence, X5 may be labeled as an objective node. Lastly, a causal model may have a variable number of such interventions and objective nodes, with each one simulating an actual event. And it's important that we realize that researchers have come up with various ways of visualizing causality. The most common form of visualizing such a cause-effect relationship is through directed acyclic graphs or causal networks. It involves representing factors as nodes and the relationship between the nodes as directed edges. Another popular form of visualizing cause-effect relations are through Hase diagram. It involves, a fly, it, it involves a flowing time frame from left to right with nodes represented along the vertical axis. With each passing time step, the flow of information between the nodes in the causal graph is represented by arrows from the propagator to the affected nodes. And while these visualizations work well for small graphs, they have a higher limit on the size of the network before they start becoming difficult to comprehend. And this becomes even more profound if the nodes under consideration are far away from each other. The scalability problem is illustrated here for Hasse diagrams. Although it works great for small linear visualizations, they become cumbersome for large networks. Even though the visualization on the right contains only 15 nodes, they require the user to backtrace every effect and can also introduce an overwhelming number of crossings in a large-scale causal system. Visualization inherently is in inclined for communication by virtue of its graphical form, resulting in the notion of communication-minded visualizations. And combining this idea with storytelling yields the notion of data-driven storytelling. And we believe that data-driven storytelling naturally follows the idea of visualizations for explanation and this led us to brainstorm on a few questions, the foremost amongst them being, can there be a better way of visualizing causality? And can text be utilized as that medium? If yes, what information can be encapsulated in the narratives to enhance the user's understanding? And lastly, how should the narratives be rendered to aid further causal exploration? These brainstorming sessions led us to, to the following contributions. We first discussed the design space for causality representations, focusing in particular on textual narratives. We then report on a crowdsourced user study where we asked participants to recover causality information from dynamic graphs with and without an associated textual narrative. And based on the results, we also present a textual narrative and implementation in the causework system for understanding the impact of specific interventions in a causal model. And lastly, we also studied the utility of these narratives by interviewing a few experts. The first step involved brainstorming on the design space for the narratives, where we answered the what, which, how, and the where questions. We start with content selections on the top, where we decided on the type of questions the narrative should answer. The next step involves deciding on how the above extracted information will be structured together. And to limit the verbosity, we decided on focusing our attention on only the intervention and the target nodes, while prioritizing important nodes in the causal path. Further, we also aggregated nodes together in the narrative to provide as much information in as little words as possible. Next, we thought about how the text should be rendered to provide more emphasis on important information. And lastly, to make the narratives more dynamic, we made the narratives more interactive by coupling them with features like brushing, drill downs, and hyperlinks. In the example narrative der derived from a design space, we can see proper categorization of the narratives under cause effect, correlation, and the life cycle categories, while also seeing aggregation of nodes and actions by leveraging the connectivity information offered by the network. 
to test out the effectiveness of such narratives in answering causality we performed a crowd sourced user study using a task based evaluation of static visualizations and narratives a total of 150 participants were crowd sourced with it be conducted on the amazon mechanical turk platform we experimented with four different factors the type of visualization shown wherein the participants could either get causal graphs or the acid diagram second some visualizations had a descriptive narrative attached and the others didn't which allowed us to understand the effectiveness of narratives in understanding causality third graphs of different difficulty level were introduced this allowed us to measure how the effectiveness of the narrative scaled with the difficulty of the graphs and lastly we also tried out two different scopes of narratives one gave a, gave an instantaneous account of cause effect relationships and the other gave an holistic overview of impacts across the entire time span the design of the study involved dividing the above factors into six different conditions h1 to h3 and the n n1 to n3 as shown in this table Each condition contains all levels of difficulty, but only a single visualizations, and we recruited twenty-five participants for each condition. As we can see in the visual depiction of each of the conditions, the left image depicts Hasse diagrams, whereas the right image depicts the Nordling diagrams. The H one N one condition contains only the graphs, providing a cumulative scope. The H two N two conditions couples the previous previous uh, condition with the narratives that also provide a cumulative scope. On the other hand the H3 N3 conditions provide the visualizations along with the narrative but they cover instantaneous scopes. We divided the task or the question into three broad types namely influence causality and life cycle with each containing two or more subtypes and the corresponding question structures. Each participants each participant was shown 12 graph system for each of small medium and hard with the questions covering two analysis subtasks. Finally we clubbed the results from the 150 participants and allowed these results to guide us in the developing of the text of the generated text the first result shown here compares the correctness between the six experimental groups as we can see the conditions for the textual narratives which is h2 h3 n2 and n3 performed better as compared to conditions without the narratives the h1 and the n1 we also know that the participants performed better when they were presented with a node link diagram as compared to when they were presented with the hasse diagram which encourage us to use these node link diagrams in the system next we compare the effectiveness of the narratives in answering different question types that is causality influence and life cycle and although the correctness scores increased for all the three question types when the narratives were turned on more drastic improvements were seen in influence and the life cycle questions we finally we compared the completion time for all the six conditions and we saw that the conditions with narratives took longer time to answer questions and we attribute this higher time to the time it took to read the associated narratives the major take away from the user study was that the narratives do complement the visualizations by providing explanatory text snippets the fact that causal graphs had a higher accuracy uh, score than the hasse diagrams drove us to use them as the visualization medium in the cause work system the study also encourages us to allocate a separate paragraph to talk about the trends followed by important notes and lastly as we saw earlier it also supports the aggregation feature wherein to reduce the verbosity of the textual snippets notes experience similar, similar trends should be combined Based on the feedback we received from the user study we set about developing the actual narratives the narrative consists of two broad modules impact summary and the projected trends which are divided into further sub modules which we'll look into in the following slides so let's start with the effect module the effect module usually contributes the first sentence of the narrative and provides information on the propagation effect of each intervention on the specified target nodes Each effect sentence in the above module may or may not be followed by a sentence from the major effect module. This module tries to capture the important notes along the causal path between the interventions and the objectives, thus shining light on those causal path notes that experience the highest variation in either direction. The no effect module articulates the specific interventions that aren't responsible for the changes observed in the objective notes. as well as those objective nodes that remain unaffected due to the combined effect of all the interventions imposed on the network the maximum effect module traverses through all the nodes in the system instead of only the causal path nodes and finds the nodes experiencing the maximum variation along both the positive and the negative axis 
Next, we turn our focus on our second module, which is the projected trends. The first sub-module, the time series module, parses over the temporal information for entities in the causal path and captures key change trajectories observed uh, for those nodes. The Wikification module involves parsing through the summary paragraphs in the corresponding Wikipedia pages for important notes mentioned in the time series module and attaches key descriptive information to provide context to the narrative. Important notes found in the previous step are further analyzed to check for presence of spikes or trolls during the time span in consideration and this provides information to the user of any key abnormalities or milestones that might have occurred in these notes. Now let's see how these narratives come to life in the Coursework system, a system that incorporates techniques to develop coherent, concise and explainable causal visualizations augmented by narratives for use by analysts. The whiteboard allows the user to dynamically create causal networks via a drag and drop functionality, as can be seen to enhance user inference, visual cues such as color and thickness is used. The nodes and edges change their color according to the effect that they experience. Next, the intervention pane allows one to view all the interventions in a single place. The node color indicates the relative increase or decrease in value, whereas the word skill graphics represent the exact relative change. Similar to the interventions pane, the objective pane shows all the chosen objective nodes in a single place. And as can be seen, the nodes have a similar word skill graphics and the graph visualization pane, which can be zoomed uh, on. The generated narratives are displayed dynamically right next to the causal network and adhere to the design principles and the results introduced earlier through, the, through concepts such as reordering of the important nodes and limiting the verbosity by including only the important nodes. The interventions and the objectives are highlighted and further corroborated with the brushing feature to spatially identify the corresponding node in the causal network. We conducted an expert review to validate the narrative engine. We recruited five experts and engaged them in an hour-long session in a pair analytic setting. Overall, our experts were impressed with how the narrative augments the causal graph in the system, especially to tackle large-scale causal systems, while also lauding the presentation order of causal information that is being presented. However, they also suggested making the narrative more robust by including a model summary of the underlying causal model and putting character level constraints on module lengths and increasing interactivity through features like hyperlinking. Future work is geared towards conducting another user study with the Cosbook system to evaluate performance benefits in a more interactive setting. Uh, the current method also is, is, is designed in line with the temporal datasets with future work targeted towards a more generic approach that ingests non-temporal datasets, as well as incorporating a visual function to focus the user's attention on important nodes and links. I'd like to acknowledge NSF for the support and collaboration on this project and thank you for listening. Okay, thank you very much for watching, and uh, yeah, it's a very, really, really great talk. And uh, see the Discord. Oh, not yet. Maybe people are thinking about the questions. So I will have a question first. Mm -hmm. um, uh, have you think of the is the vision coding of? Uh, narratives in 
in a fair colors and have you evaluate them? Um, I'm sorry, the question wasn't quite clear. Uh, your voice was breaking off. Okay. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, I mean, so have you uh, just for a short one is that do you think the narratives and together with the glyphs design or the color encodings affect the result of the narrative or understanding of the people? Uh, yeah, so one of the things we wanted to, we, we did was we introduced interactivity in the narratives or in the in the Causeworks tool. And we wanted that, uh, we wanted the user to better, the whole part was the narratives would be uh, aiding the uh, the visualization that was there. And one of the ways we wanted to do that was by introducing the color changes. The other one was introducing brushing technology so that the uh, narratives people could brush over the nodes in the narrative and that they and that could spatially uh, find or locate that node in the visualization itself so the whole idea was for the narrative to aid the visualization and not replace it altogether so uh, all these uh, rendering techniques did did form a very integral part from the very beginning of the design itself okay Thank you. And uh, I'm also wondering that uh, because you didn't mention about a specific technique you used for the generating the narrative. Could you briefly uh, talk about it? Uh, so, yeah, so we went through when, so uh, the narrative itself or the entire process of generating the narrative. So uh, we went through this four step cycle where we wherein we introduced the design uh, of how the narratives might look like then we wanted to validate that design and so we went through the user study process uh, the results of which formulated uh, which segments uh, of the narrative should actually be part of the final tool the callworks tool and then we went to the callworks tool uh, but if your question was specifically about how the narratives were formulated uh, that we, we segmented the narrative into two different parts, one, one being the impact summary and the other being the time series. Uh, uh, the, the impact summary specifically talked about the uh, effect of those interventions on the objective nodes and covered the entire uh, scope of that. So basically it covered the, what is the effect, what are the major uh, nodes in the causal path that caused uh, that effect uh, and uh, which were the nodes that did not cause any effect, uh, if any, and uh, in the entire system, uh, in the entire system, which effects, which which nodes were affected the most, or which nodes were affected the most in uh, the in either direction. It may be the positive direction, which nodes increased, which nodes value increased the most, and which nodes values decreased the most. And then the second part being the temporal uh, aspect of the nodes, wherein we talked about the. Um, the trends followed by important nodes and we also wanted to augment that information with extra uh, extra text from red readily available sources for example and that is why uh, a module of the of, of the narrative was the wikification module and lastly uh, one thing that that really shines out is is the fact that we also introduced a spike uh, and a spike analysis wherein if, if, if a node did increase or if, say if, even if a node did not increase its value across across the entire life cycle or, or those 12 timestamps, there might be cases where, where, where a node in, uh, experience a sudden increase in value and then comes back to a normal state. And looking at the graph itself, the visualization itself, it might, it might not be that clear, but our narrative does point out that particular thing and that may be very important or might be very important to the end user. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. And because of time, so probably, and uh, we should change to the next speaker. And thank you, Ajin. And uh, you. so we come to the, our, uh, the next one is uh, Zhuo Chenjing, and uh, his talk is Visual Causality Analysis of Event Sequence Data. Let's welcome. Hi, I'm Zhuo Chengjing from Tongji University. I will be presenting our work Visual Causality Analysis of Event 6 Data. This work is in collaboration with Shunan Guo Nanchen Professor Daniel Weskov, 
Professor Dai Gao and Professor Nan Cao. Event sequences are widely classed in the form of a series of timestamp events. Analyzing collection of temporal event sequences can help analysis extract color effect relations between events. For example, color relations between clinical events can get doctor in learning the etiological factor and found a more effective treatment. In temporal data, discovery of color relationships is commonly based on the theory of Granger causality. Granger causality is capable of calculating causality in temporal data according to the incremental predictability. If the occurrence of an event A enhances the predictability of an event B, then event A gradually causes event B. To learn gradual causality in vaccine data, we can use graphic modeling, local processes, and deep neural networks. However, many of these models rely on rather general resumption of the data distributions, which may fail to cause a sufficient amount of domain-specific knowledge. In addition, the high complexity of color models can lead to a lack of sufficient interpretability and explainability to support decision making. Also, the unique characteristic of investing data poses several special challenges for the color analysis. First, investing data sets often contain a large variety of event types. This high dimensionality of investing data can significantly increase the complexity of the color analysis result. Second, sequence of various event types occurring in different orders lead to a high heterogeneity between individuals. This results in difficulties in interpretation and the verification of the causal analysis results. To address the formal mentioned challenges, we want to incorporate the human knowledge in causality analysis. We also want to enhance the interpretability and explainability and address the temporal complexity specified in causality analysis of event 6 data. We introduced the causal and interactive visual analytics system for analyzing causal relationships in event 6 data, which is driven by a back to end causality analysis model that consists of three key steps, training a hoax process model to fit the event 6 data set, Inferring gradual causality from the model parameters and incorporating user modifications to refine the model. In the first step, a hoax process model is built to simulate the event sequences. The model evaluates the inference of historical event on the occurrence probability of future events. In particular, the occurrence probability of event V is defined as follows. Function phi in the second term is the time varying impact function that captures the inference of historical event, which is controlled by the impact coefficient A. In the second step, we infer gradual causality between events from the model parameters by minimizing the loss function introduced in the previous paper. The first term is a negative log likelihood of hoax process. The second term is a group loss and regularizer to sparse the parameter space. After training, the impact coefficients capture the color relations between events. Thus, we can obtain a structured causal graph whose edges are weighted by the color strength. To incorporate human knowledge in causality analysis, we design the user feedback mechanism that allows the user to confirm or delete the color relations in the color graph. The model will be retrained with user input. Specifically, if a color relation is deleted by the user, the constraint of the objective function issues that the model parameter are optimized towards setting the corresponding impact coefficient as zero. A color relation is confirmed by the user. The updates of the corresponding impact coefficient can be deliberated from the group loss and regularizer. This aims to prevent the impact coefficient from being set as zero. To support visual causality analysis, we developed a visual interface to facilitate three major functionality, color exploration, color verification, and color comparison. The user explores the causality by first querying a subset based on the occurrence of key events and the attributes of the records. After querying the dataset, 
the color analysis module generates the color relations between events. The color relations are demonstrated in the color model view as a node link graph, with a node presenting event type and a link presenting color relations pointing from the cause to effect. Help the user capture the special color structures such as color trends and color circles, which arrived a layout algorithm that calculates the position for each node. This algorithm is designed to illustrate those local structures and reduce the visual complexity of the graph. To further relieve the user from investigating and verifying many color relations at a time, the system incorporates a user-driven color exploration. The intention is to uncover only causal pathways that lead to an outcome event of interest to reduce the number of events and color relations involved. This procedure starts by ending an outcome event as an initial effect. By double-clicking on the effect, the graph expands one level at the top to show the direct causes. To explore color trends of the outcome event, users can continue to explain the graph by interactively uncovering causes of the topmost events. The effect under inspection is colored in gray and the causes are colored by their cause strengths. In addition, an auto ring is displayed on each node, and the length represents the proportion of row sequences that have the cause and effect event appear successively. In color verification, to help users interpret and examine the validity of causality analysis result, we associate the calculated color relations with the original data by uncovering the color patterns in row event sequences. The user can select a color relation, for example, event A causes event B, and observe how the sequences progress through the cause and effect from the causal sequence view. In particular, there are three categories of color patterns. Sequence that go through the cause but never come across the effect afterward. Sequences that contain both cause and effect in a successive order. Sequences that have the effect but not the cause before. In visualization, the leftmost and the rightmost node indicates the cause and the effect event colored in white and gray. The edges between nodes indicate groups of sequences colored by the sequence categories. The height of a node and the edges is it proportional to the number of sequences. Other potential causes structured by the color graph are also displayed to help the user explore other possible color relations and justify the validity of the selected color relation. The potential causes are vertically aligned and horizontally ordered from left to right by their average time of occurrence. To make it easier to observe the commonness in the occurrence of potential causes, sequences are reordered to accurate common potential causes. The sequence reordering problem can be abstracted into a traveling Selman problem, in which the concept of cities and distance represent sequence and their pairwise similarity. The pairwise similarity of two sequences is defined as follows. In this way, sequences in close proximity can have more potential causes in common and can be aggregated. After verifying the causality, the user can confirm a color relation by clicking the Confirm button in the tooltip. After the user finishes confirming the color relations, the model can be updated by clicking the Finish button. Every time the user updates the color in this model, the model diagnostics panel records the change of the overall model quality. The performance of the model is evaluated by three metrics, the regression likelihood, the baseline information criterion, and the p-value. The circles are positioned in a two-dimensional space defined by the number of model updates on the x-axis and the mean regression likelihood on the y-axis. The arrow bar presents the standard deviation of the regression likelihood. The color of the circle equals the change of baseline information criteria score in comparison to the previous model. Green circle presents the better generalization capability, and the red circles present the worst. In color comparison, we use a adjacency matrix to compare the occurrence of all color relations in two groups. The row of the matrix presents causes, and the color represents effects. 
Each cell is divided into an outer region and an inner region. With the background color saturation representing the color strength in the first group and the second group, respectively. We assess the usefulness of our system through two forms of evaluations. A quantitative study showing the effectiveness of user feedback mechanism, and a qualitative case studies demonstrating the usefulness of the system. We employ a mean track data set to, to evaluate the effectiveness of user feedback mechanism. In the data set, each sequence records the trends of a representative quarter across the various website, and each event presents an occurrence of a quarter on a website. The ground truth causality was provided by whether one website contained the hyperlink linking to another site. The performance of user feedback mechanism on the three metrics, the regression likelihood based on information criterion, and the area on the ROC is shown as follows. These results indicate that the user feedback mechanism generally improves the goodness of fit of the causality analysis model and the accuracy of the analysis results. The case study employs a mimic data set which contain electronic health records of over 46,000 patients. In particular, we filled the patients who were diagnosed with pneumonia. We invited two pulmonologists to participate in our case study. They identified a list of key events that may be colorly related for the analysis under the category of laboratory tests and medical treatments. The doctor started by ending oxygen value increase as an outcome event to explore its causes, which is an important sign of recovery for pneumonia in patients. From color and method results, the doctor found the full treatment that can make the patient recover. Moreover, the doctor noticed that her patient were taken the full treatment if the pH value in their blood was abnormal. The doctor further examined the causes of the abnormal pH value and found a color circle among three laboratory indices, including oxygen carbon dioxide and pH values. The value of oxygen carbon dioxide and pH in blood affect each other. Because of this cyclical causality, the conditions of patients will keep getting worse. Finally, the doctor compared the color relations of a middle-aged cohort and an older-aged cohort in the color comparison view and found that some antibiotic medicines are more effective for middle-aged patients. In this paper, we presented a causality analysis algorithm with a user feedback mechanism to leverage human knowledge in revising the analysis model and a visual analytic system to help a user discover causal relations through the causal exploration, verification, and comparison. In the future, a more scalable visualization and efficient interaction mechanism for high-dimensional color graph are required. Also, we still need to explore more advanced color analysis algorithms that are capable of mining combined causes in event sequences. Thanks, and any questions? Thank you very much for your talk. And due to the time, probably we have only one quick question. And uh, so would you, could you explain more about a combined course, please? Just a in the shot. Uh, okay, well, I will take an example to, to explain it. Uh, for example, in the medical domain, it is possible that uh, an effect is caused by the combination of two treatments. Uh, not one single treatment will not work. Okay, yeah, thank you for your quick question and answer. And there are some dis uh, Discord questions there. Would you please go there to answer it? Okay, yeah. uh, thank you very much. And uh, okay, let's go to our last talk by Sarah. And uh, her talk is sequence braiding 
visual overviews of temporal event sequences and attributes. Let's welcome. Hello, my name is Sarah Di Bartolomeo. I'm a PhD candidate at Northeastern Univers University in Boston, working on layered network layout algorithms. Today, I'm going to talk to you about our paper, Sequence Braiding. Sequence Braiding is a method to display an overview of multiple sequences of events so that trends and patterns can stand out. Sequence Braiding deals with sequences of events. This kind of data can be, for example, sequences of DNA nucleotides, sequences of moves in a chess game, or logs of the calories that a person had throughout a day. We developed this we developed sequence braiding to visualize this type of dataset, but above all, we developed sequence braiding to help identify trends and patterns in sequences of events. Each line represents a day. Each node corresponds to an event. Each edge is a relationship of sequentiality between two events. Events that follow the same pattern get bundled together, making a trend easier to spot. In this example here, you are looking at 20 days. This example here in particular presents our diabetes case study that was our main motivation to develop this visualization. It is showing the blood glucose of a patient before every meal they had in 20 days. It can help a doctor and a patient answer questions such as what proportion of lunches in this period had high blood glucose, but also what does usually come before a high blood glucose lunch and after this other example here, instead, is 200 games of chess, 200 openings to be precise. Each line represents a sequence of moves of the white player, and each group is a chess piece type. You can see that most openings start with a pawn, and very little with the knight. After moving a pawn, it is common to move a knight or another pawn, while it is a little less common to move a bishop, and only a little number of bold players move the queen as their second move. Regarding design requirements, we wanted something that could align many events without having to juxtapose many aligned visualizations. One should be able to have a holistic overview of the dataset. It should let the reader have a sense of the distribution of values among events in each event type. Indeed, if you focus on just the nodes in a column, you can read each column almost like a bar chart. Then we have the issue that we deal with human-generated data, and human-generated data is messy and it can often contain errors. Here, for example, you can see that there's a snack missing, while all the other days have it, or here you can see two snacks logged one after the other. We do not make any assumption on the order of events, and our visualization should be robust with regards to arbitrary ordering, absence, or duplication of events. We also wanted unique sequences to still be identifiable, so that if you want to focus on a specific day, you can do that. And even more in detail, our users should be able to focus on a specific event, or on a group of events, and clearly be able to focus on the precursor of those events or the after effect events, what follows, for example, after a very high blood glucose launch. Let's quickly address the algorithm, since a big chunk of our work was spent on that. First of all, we define a set of sequences as a directed graph. As said before, each event in a sequence corresponds to a node, and each edge represents a relationship of sequentiality between two events. Our algorithm has two key steps, rank assignment and intersection reduction. The first one, the rank assignment step, deals with deciding in what order the events will be displayed and how the nodes are assigned to the columns that are in the graph. It does so by using a string alignment algorithm so that we can obtain a unique sequence that fits all the sequences present in the dataset called the shortest common supersequence. The shortest common supersequence is the sequence that contains all the sequences of a collection as subsequences. In other words, if u is the supersequence of x and y, u should contain both x and y. Assume that we have a sequence of meals. 
Here you can see three days of meals. Adding gaps and moving them around a little, we can obtain the super sequence of these three days of meals. In this way, if we take a representation of sequences as nodes and edges, we can assign a rank, a colon, to each node. In this way, we make sure that we have matches across those sequences, and it also allows us to keep events that are often subsequent close together, creating clusters of edges that form high-level visual patterns. Infrequent events, instead, stand out from the rest. It also allows us to be robust towards inconsistencies and to never have cycles. Now, our nodes are going to have a quantitative attribute too, like in the case of diabetes, it's going to be the blood glucose of the person at that point in the day. Now, we want to have all the nodes with the same attribute close together, and we want the Y position of these nodes to reflect the value of the attribute. So we move them around uh, to respect this criteria. If we now add back the edges that connect nodes to the subsequent nodes in the same sequence, we notice that it's not very easy to read. Surely there must be a better way to arrange them in their ranks to make it more readable, while still keeping them grouped together. For this, we use intersection reduction. In this step, we reorganize nodes within the columns in order to make them more readable. Our method is based on the barycentric method, which, with the difference that we allow grouping and that we keep a hierarchical structure in the groups. In this way, meals that often happen subsequently appear close together, and common chains of events and attributes appear grouped, making the trend stand out. On the opposite, rare events catch the eye, as they look like outliers not grouped with the others. The output is a graph layout that supports many event alignment, allows the holistic analysis of a set of sequences, yet ensures specific sequences are uniquely identifiable. As a little addition to share some more details that can be in the dataset, we developed a little plugin. It can be positioned on one of the sides, and for each day it can show a number of additional characteristics. Here it shows the date, the amount of carbohydrates throughout a day, and the percentage of time spent in high, normal, or low, or low blood glucose. It can also help in sorting the sequences, selecting them, highlighting them according to any one of the represented characteristics. To test how good sequence braiding is compared to other methods, we conducted a comparative evaluation. Our criteria for selecting the baseline were that it needed to support event sequence visualization, because that's the whole point of sequence braiding. It should support at least some kind of aggregation by attribute, and finally, it should be open source. As candidates for the baseline, we considered storylines, story flow, but ultimately ended up deciding to use IDMVs as a baseline. Indeed, IDMVs has a similar purpose, supporting type 1 diabetes treatment through visualization. We are mostly interested in this part of IDMVs, the main view, that is the one we claim we want to simplify. This view here can display a maximum of 14 days and uses color and the Y position of a node to indicate the blood glucose level at a particular point in time, and triangles are used to show when meals happened. As you can see, it's hard to spot trends that span across different days, and I can't see more than 14 days. There are still ways to facilitate spotting trends, and IDMVs offers different types of alignment in order to do that. Here, for example, you are seeing sequences aligned by lunch and dinner, represented by, those train, represented by those green triangles. Still, no more than two events at a time can be aligned. We run an experiment with a within subject approach with 25 participants. In order to be fair to both visualizations, we choose a set of tasks to be analyzed that did not penalize either one. So this meant that, for example, we could not never have more than 14 days. We had our participants go through seven questions on each one of the two visualizations. Overall, we found that there is good evidence that participants are faster using sequence braining rather than IDMVs. This, this time improvement was primarily on tasks which involved analyzing the sequentiality of events. Simpler tasks had much less difference. The most outstanding time improvement is, is found in task 6, which involved comparing two time intervals and finding a pattern. 
it is also the only relevant difference in correctness. From our qualitative data, we found that one, sequence braiding helps identify overall patterns, and two, can be more suitable for more complex datasets with longer duration. Participants responded feeling more confident performing tasks using sequence braiding versus IDMBs. Likewise, participants preferred sequence braiding versus IDMBs regarding ease of use for understanding trends and patterns. Finally, 52% of the participants reported sequence braiding as most useful for displaying trends, compared to 36% for IDMBs. So this is the end of the presentation. We saw a temporal event visualization that focuses on being able to present trends and patterns, and we saw an evaluation showing how presenting data with this overview visualization works better to present patterns than our other. Thank you for listening. Here's my co-authors, and if you are curi curious, you can find the documentation website with several examples and our preprint on OSF in those link on the right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. And it's really a good talk and uh, I collect some questions. So, uh, the questions ask that does your visualization scale for large scale, for large data set, also high number of event type and long sequence, also multiple attributes? So, it depends on. It depends on the number of sequences, obviously. Uh, we tested it. It works reasonably fast, up to 500 event sequences of about 10 uh, events each. I have an appendix uh, in the supplemental material of the paper that I linked in the Discord um, that has uh, performance measures for several uh, amounts of sequences and uh, nodes per sequences. You can uh, look it up there. It can compute up to about 800 uh, um, sequences of events together. Uh, regarding uh, the number of attributes, regarding using, using multiple attributes in the main visualization, uh, you can uh, pick one, but we developed a plugin. It is shown in the video, but quickly, we developed a plugin to add other attributes to the visualization. So you can sort the sequences based on the number. You can search through the sequences based on the number of attributes. And in that way, you can visualize additional stuff. OK. And uh, there are another question, maybe. <clears throat> so are the users medical professionals or also patients or their caregivers? Uh, the participants of the well, the visualization is meant to be a general visualization. The diabetes part was just a case study. Mm, yes, it was developed with the idea of being used uh, during visits with patients uh, and medical professionals. You know, you may not have that much time with a medical professional if he is analyzing your results. So that was meant to quickly explain to a patient. Uh, um, <laughs> to, to, to quickly present the, the results that otherwise otherwise would be data that otherwise would be a bit too complicated. To okay, okay. okay, and thank you very much, Sarah. And also thank you all for the, all the speakers and the participants in the discourse. We have really a good discussion today. And uh, if, if you want to be uh, interested, you can go to the uh, Discord and uh, a lot of Interesting, interesting discussions. And uh, thank you for making all these sessions successful. Thank you and uh, enjoy with. Bye.
blockchain has gained more attention and its applications are emerging. We collect 76 blockchain visualization tools and systematically classify them into five aspects. Target blockchain, blockchain data, target audience, task domain, and visualization type. In the end, we look at open challenge in blockchain visualization. Nowadays, data is often distributed and owned by different participants. There is an emerging need to provide a joint visualization, such as a ts &E projection, to serve as the full picture and data analysis. If the participants are privacy sensitive, how can we build a joint projection without data leakage? Conventional embedding algorithms, such as the ts &E, are designed for single-site computation and require data centralization. Privacy leakage may h up and in three stages in the visualization pipeline. We present a framework for the visual exploration of spine simulation data. We show the force distribution on spinal discs, enable assessments of imbalances and reveal impact vectors that were not accessible before. This is a novel direction in medical visualization and we hope that it might bridge the gap between biomechanical research and clinical application. Tableau helps you see the stories in your data. It's designed to help you be smarter so you can make better decisions faster. Connect to the data you care about. Sort, highlight, drill down, or filter your data in seconds. Add calculations to extend your data. With Tableau, you can keep on asking questions in the data until you discover the root cause. Tableau, answer questions at the speed of thought.
We propose data-driven space filling curves. Our new method generates linearizations that better preserve coherency than existing techniques. Our method supports 3D datasets, and even multi-scale data on a quad tree or an arc tree. Many visualizations benefit from our method. For example, visualization of multivariate particles and visualization. To interactively explore and visually analyze large multivariate data, for example, this cosmological simulation that is clustered into dark matter halos, we create a probabilistic data model in each cluster. We present a complete visual analysis system based on this data representation, which is especially well suited for the density-based visualizations shown here. Traditional flow visualization methods, such as the line integral convolution, convey information about the underlying flow structure. However, the influence of regions in the flow on each other is not visualized. In my talk, I will present a new dense flow visualization technique, creating a multi-level hierarchy that provides insight into the region's connectivity using a probabilistic model. For more specific details, you can comment here. Many techniques can be used to render and visually explore large 3D line sets with transparency. However, all these techniques differ in several aspects such as runtime performance, memory consumption, and image quality. In this work, we provide an extensive comparison study to discuss the advantages and drawbacks of transparency rendering techniques for large line datasets. We present an interface to visually analyze and steer zero-shot learning models. Our interface is designed to diagnose attribute mispredictions to convey potential failure modes in zero-shot learning. Using our interface, the user can select multiple categories for analysis. We allow the user to steer the model by changing the weights of potentially problematic attributes based on their analysis. Firstly, we extract contours of virions and distribution of spike proteins. From a newly estimated contour a 3D mesh with evaluated triangles is obtained. In the last step, rules describing relations between protein instances are defined by the user. The resulting model is created by application of all rules on the generated 3D mesh. Hi everyone, I hope you're doing well. I'm Heike Park from Georgia Tech. I'm very excited to present Bluff, a visualization tool to interactively decipher adversary attacks on deep neural networks. Deep learning is now commonly used in many domains. For example, in the medical field, deep learning models can estimate the treatment effects on patients. On the road, we can see self-driving cars using computer vision technologies. However, deep learning models are vulnerable to adversary attacks. An adversary attack applies carefully crafted perturbations on data inputs. 
and fools a model into making incorrect predictions. Adversary attacks jeopardize many deep learning based technologies, especially in security and safety critical applications, such as data driven healthcare and self driving cars. Due to the threats of the adversary attacks, people cannot confidently use deep learning models. To overcome the vulnerability of deep learning models, we need to understand how the adversary attacks permeate the model's internals. Also, for a better understanding about adversary attacks, it would be worthwhile to examine if and how an attack strength changes how the model produces incorrect predictions. For example, it would be useful to know if a stronger attack exploits the same neurons as a weaker attack does, or if those sets are completely different. We present Bluff, an interactive visualization tool for discovering and interpreting how adversary attacks mislead DNN into making incorrect predictions. Our main idea is to visualize activation pathways within a DNN traversed by the signals of input data. For given input data, an activation pathways consist of neurons that are highly activated and the most influential paths. Activation pathways represent what features are detected and how those features are related to contribute to the final prediction. To understand how the attacks manipulate the neurons and the paths inside the models, Love visualizes the activation pathways of both benign inputs and attack inputs. That is, Bluff finds and visualizes the most activated pathways given benign and attack input data. Love also visualizes the most inhibited paths by the attack to uncover where the attack is blocking the signals to the benign path. Also, Bluff visualizes the most excited paths by the attack to uncover where the attack stimulate to induce the activation pathways going towards wrong directions. The Bluff interface tightly integrates three coordinate views. It consists of control sidebar, graph summary view, and detail view. Here, a user inspects why a deep learning model must classify adversarial giant beta images crafted by the projected gradient descent attack as armadillo. In the main graph summary view, we visualize the activation pathways of benign and attacked input data. Here, each vertex represents a neuron. When hovering over a neuron, Bluff shows the detailed information of the neuron. The detailed view for a neuron shows a feature visualization and example data that visualize what feature the neuron is detecting. For example, for giant panda images, this neuron looks for face of animals that have white furs and dark eyes. Feature visualization is a synthesized image that maximizes the corresponding neuron's activation. Dataset examples are patches of images from the training data that highly activate the corresponding neurons. We also show how the neuron's median activation to change according to different attack strengths. Here in the graph summary view, the neurons are represented with different colors based on their roles. The green nodes are the most important neurons only for the original class, giant panda, which means they are highly activated by benign giant panda images. The blue nodes are important neurons only for the target class, armadillo. The orange nodes are the most important neurons for both original and target classes, giant panda and armadillo. The red nodes are the neurons that are highly activated by only successfully attacked images. These neurons are exploited by the attack to induce the incorrect prediction. By exploring the activation pathways, PGD successfully perturbed pixels to induce the brown bird features an appearance more likely shared by an armadillo than a panna. Both armadillo and brown birds have small, roundish, and brown bodies. The brown bird neuron then contributes to the armadillo misclassification by activating more features such as scales, bumps, and mesh. By using the options in the control sidebar, 
users can interactively filter the neurons and connections to visualize. For example, they can select to visualize our graph or only highlighted neurons or only pinned neurons. By using the highlight pathways options, users can select which activation pathways to visualize, such as most activated or most inhibited, excited, or most changed by the attack. By using the comparison mode, users can compare how attacks of different strengths have different activation pathways. In summary, we developed Bluff, an interactive system to understand how adversarial perturbations fool a deep learning model. Bluff visualizes most activated, inhibited, excited activation pathways after the attacks and provides flexible comparison of attack escalation. Thank you all for listening. I'm happy to take any questions. We present columnar data augmentation through visual analytics. Kava lets users augment their data with additional attributes found on knowledge graphs. To construct a new attribute, each row of a data set is mapped to a node on a knowledge graph. Each augmented datum is the result of a query over the knowledge graph in the neighborhood of that node. The mixture graph is a data structure for compressing, rendering, and querying segmented volumes. Biomedical segmentations have evolved from mere annotations to first-class modalities. The mixture graph stores the computations required to render such nominal data directly on the GPU, including pre-filtering and lighting. Segment distributions can be queried efficiently using regions of interest. Visualizations are about visual patterns, but there's more, much more. We show the connections between more than 100 arguments on why visualization works. And don't forget to check out our website.